Hey, turn your Bibles um, to Mark. We are finishing up chapter 11. And so there is a copy of the scripture in front of you. Someone give me a page number for anybody that's looking through. 723. 723. Thank you, John. Um, I'm, uh, one, I'm easily distracted. Two, I'm also visual. So having this in front of me is helpful. Some of you go like, I can't listen and read at the same time. Do what works for you. But um, it's, I, I really like that. And I also like taking notes and underlining. It just helps me see what's going on. The reason why we're gathered here in this part right now is because God speaks. And he speaks through his word. So that's what we're going to give attention to right now. I'm going to pause and pray just as we begin. God, help us as we listen to your word hear it read and preached. God, help us to hear you and then respond to you. Thank you. Amen. Okay, I think we have a title, which is, What Authority Does Jesus Have? Now, we've done this a couple times because it's so prevalent in the book of Mark. Um, How many of you that the word of authority is not like a happy word for you? My hand's up. Not a happy word. How many of you, it is a happy word for you? Not as many of those, some, okay? Authority's not a bad word, but most of us, our our gut reaction to it isn't really good. Uh, Some of us are a child of the um, 70s. Sign, sign, everywhere, sign. Um, There were, I am a child of the 70s, and when I grew up, I'm not saying this is good, I'm just describing it, but there was something about um, extra rules and signs that kind of... um, it didn't bring out a great response from me. I actually think it's what Paul speaks of in Romans when he talks about the purpose of the law. The law didn't make me sin. It simply revealed the very sin that was within me. That would be true. I went to a college that had some particular rules. When I moved to Michigan, I moved into a community that had some particular defining rules. Also, both have been a little bit uh, difficult to navigate. But authority's not bad. There's good authority. In fact, I mean, that's what holds Um, communities together, some kind of definition. We should always thank God for public servants that help that. But the question of authority comes up in Jesus' text, in the text about Jesus. Now, we're going to read it in a moment, but you remember what happened last week. It was Monday. He's in that final week when he's going to die, and he just cleared out the temple. In fact, he cleared out that very place that was meant to be a place of prayer, particularly for the non-ethnically Jewish people, the Gentiles. What, but it, what it had become is a glorified flea market. It was dense with people, money changers, selling animals. It smelled. It was a, just a passageway for people. It was not a place or he could pray very easily. And connect with God. And that's what it was meant to be. And that's where we see the righteous anger of Jesus coming out. As he's clearing out the temple. That's what he's doing. And then he teaches some. So that's what's just happened. And Jesus is now being confronted. Because he has disrupted a very profitable business. That has affected their bottom line forecast for the year. There's a lot of money they're missing out right now. Because it's Passover week. He gets confronted by this group. So we're going to see two things today. The confrontation and what Jesus does. And then Jesus teaches with a parable. I'm just going to read them in sections. Let's, let's look first at the confrontation. This is the end of chapter 11. And they came again to Jerusalem. That's the disciples. So this would be about Tuesday. And as he was walking in the temple, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders came to him. And they said to him, By what authority are you doing these things and who gave you this authority to do them? Jesus said to them, I will ask you one question, answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? Answer me. And they discussed it with one another saying, if we say from heaven, then he will say, why then did you not believe him? But shall we say from man? They were afraid of the people, for they, that is all the people, held that John really was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And Jesus said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Let's just think about what's going on here. 
So we read in verse 27, this is the confrontation, that there's three groups of people. There's the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. So they're actually distinct groups, but these would have been the three parties that made up the ruling um, uh, judicial branch called the Sanhedrin, the very court that tries Jesus. And they're, they're these three collective parties that make that up. Um, the question they ask is meant to be a trap question. By whose authority are you doing these things and who gave you this authority to do them? It's, it's meant to actually embarrass Jesus. It's kind of a, hey, you just cleared out the temple. We're like the temple guys here. Show us your credentials. Jesus had none, except that he was God. He was. He's God's son. But he was not a scribe. He was not a priest. He was not one of the leading town elders. They wanted to embarrass him. Show us your credentials. Or they were hoping that he would just speak it out plain. I am God. And then they would have him convict him of blasphemy and kill him there on the spot. Jesus was not scared of declaring himself to be God. And when you read uh, Mark, he does that in various ways. But he knew what his time was and he knew when it would be time to die. So he says it in different ways as it comes along. But that's what they're hoping. It was a trap question. On the other hand, it is a very good question, is it not? Hey, who gave you this authority? That, that's an excellent question. Who is Jesus? From where is his authority? In fact, it's a central question throughout the Gospel of Mark. So if you're still beginning Bible reading, let me commend to you. Why don't you just take the Gospel of Mark and read through it? And as you do, here's what, what you'll see in the very beginning chapters. He uses that word authority a lot. In other words, Mark wants us to get who Jesus is. And here's what we see right in the very beginning, chapter 1, verse 30, uh, 22, he says, Jesus taught. Not like the other guys. He taught with authority. Later in chapter 1, he says he shows Jesus' authority over demons. When Jesus is encountering a demon, I mean, the demons are immediately submitting to him. They obey him. They yield to him. He had authority over demons. In chapter 2, Jesus speaks these words. Now tell me if this would be God or man here. So that you know that the, the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins, I say to you, stand up and walk. It's a guy who had been paralyzed. So that you will know, this whole crowd, that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins. I say to you, stand up and walk. I'm sorry, anybody here claim to have authority to forgive sins? Human beings don't, don't proclaim that. He's saying he's God, and he had authority to forgive sins. He delegates authority at some point when he sends the 12 out so they could um, deliver people from demons. I think it's chapter 4 where the, the disciples are around him and he's just calmed the sea, this big storm and they, they recognize his authority over creation and they say, who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? All throughout, Jesus' authority is obvious. Mark wants us to see that and so he's bringing this out. It's a, it's a good question. They mean it as a trap. But it is a very, very important question. I want to say to you, it's a very important question for every single one of us. Who is Jesus? By what authority did he work and act and speak? Because if he is from God, that means something for every single one of us. And you cannot be passive about it. We'll see that actually in Jesus' answer. Really? Isn't Jesus' answer an interesting one? Why doesn't he just say it? Jesus responds, he gets a question, and he responds back with a question. So what's going on here? Now, in one sense, that would be typical of a Jewish rabbi to do that. Um, but Jesus is doing something more than simply being a, a typical rabbi. And some might go, man, it's, it sounds like he's dodging the question, doesn't it? Like if your kid answered you that way, that wouldn't be like really good, you know, when you, when you ask a direct question, okay? So you can get like, is he dodging the question? He is not dodging the question. Here's what he's doing. He is testing their authenticity. 
Do they really want to know who he is? So he's not asking them some meaningless question like, uh, I'll answer you if you tell me what the color of the planet Jupiter is. He's not saying something stupid. He actually, he's got a specific thing he's asking them. He says, you, you tell me about John the Baptist. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? He's testing their authenticity. You see, John had been sent by God. And John testified that Jesus was the Lamb of God. Sent from heaven. So what did they think of John's ministry? Thousands of people were affected by John's preaching and his direct call that they needed to repent and get right with God. Many of them took the step of baptism in order to consecrate themselves to God. John was prophetic. He was unconventional. He was not a trained rabbi. He was not an educated scribe. And John was called by God as a prophet. He greatly affected people for God. And Jesus spoke of John and said that he was a prophet sent from God. Jesus said that he's actually the Elijah who was to come, who was foretold. So here's the Pharisees. Many of them did not like John's preaching because he preached against them. So now how are they going to answer Jesus' question? And Mark tells us the discussion. You can just imagine them, you know, he asked this. You can just imagine the discussions going around as they talk about this. If they acknowledge that John was sent by God, then Jesus would say to them, oh, then why didn't you believe him? And if they answer, well, he was just a man, he acted a little bizarre, and then the people are going to turn on them. All the people recognized John as a prophet, so they're stuck. How did they respond? Tell me what he said. Look at the text. What do they say? What's the words they use? We don't know. Really? Really? You don't know? What is that? That's cop out. That's a, that's a non-answer. They, that's weak. They just bail out. They give a non-answer. They're not being honest. They're not even being honest with themselves. That's pretty serious. They did not want to decide. Pause. Don't people do that with Jesus all the time? They don't want to decide. They know they don't, they don't want to declare it. This is all in response to whose authority is this? They know. A non-answer is not honest. This is about who this is, Jesus Christ, and yielding to his authority. Now, Jesus goes on and, and teaches in a parable. Let's, let's read this. Uh, we don't know, this was probably immediate because it appears the same group is there. It, there could have been some time lapse, but it's, it's in this whole context of whose authority is this. Here's what Jesus is. Now, he, now he's teaching. He began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and put a fence around it, and he dug a pit for the wine press and built a tower, and he leased it to the tenants and went into another country. When the season came, he sent a servant to the, temp, to the tenants to get from them some of the fruit of the vineyard, and they took him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Again, he sent to them another servant, and they struck him on the head and treated him shamefully. And he sent another, and him they killed. And so with many others, some they beat and some they killed. He had still one other, a, a beloved son. Finally, he sent him to them, saying, they will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. And they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Have you not read this scripture? He's quoting here the Old Testament. Actually, this is something they would have read that week. This is actually from Psalm 118 which is part of the Passover celebration. Have you not read this scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. And they were seeking to arrest him, but feared the people. I love this next phrase. For they perceived that he had told this parable against them. Yep. 
So they left him and went away. So what we see in the, the first nine verses is the parable. The ninth verse kind of gets a little bit to the point. Verses 10 and 11, he now is explaining the parable through Scripture. And then verse 12, we see the response. So let's just kind of walk through this. You ever, you ever wonder why Jesus teaches in parables? I mean, what is a parable? A parable is this, it's this story. It's not a super complex story. It has some details. But there is something about God that's being said here. And parables, by their very nature, are meant to really provoke us to think. Um, let's admit that we live in a microwave society, okay? We want stuff fast, don't we? We want, just get, it, get me the stuff, get, just boil it down, just tell me what I got to do, boom, boom, boom. that's what we want to do. And you can do that about God and miss some very significant things. So Jesus isn't interested in just, okay, who, who's the check, check, quick people? I am. Hey, who, give me some more of those. Come on, guys. All right. So we got to slow down and just kind of listen sometimes. And our society moves pretty fast. So a parable is meant to provoke us to think, particularly to think deeply about God. And I don't care how many times you read the Bible, a lot or little. Let's not think we got them all figured out. Let's slow down and think. We need to know him as he is. That's why we keep making an appeal to become Bible readers. But that's what the parable's about. That's what parables, I mean, their purpose is, is to have us think deeply about God. So here it is. There's a, a, this guy plants his vineyard, and then he goes and puts a fence around it. Um, just like you would, you know, keep the deer out, to keep the foxes out of coming into the vineyard. And then what he does, he digs this big pit, and that's where the, uh, the, the wine press will be, so that's where the, the grape stomping would be. And then at the end of the pit, there's like this, this funnel that went down, all the juice would collect. And then it says that he built this tower, which would be like a, a grain elevator. So in the tower, that's where the wine would be stored. And so then what the guy does is he... I mean, the owner, he goes and gets some sharecroppers who are going to work that vineyard. And the arrangement would be, they work the vineyard. Um, I built it. I had the investment in it, bought the land, um, the crops, planted, got that all done. And so they would share in the proceeds. Each would get a certain percentage as they arranged. And so it's, it's time for the harvest. The vineyard's been worked. And he now sends one of his servants to receive the share that would have been arranged. And it's at that point we realize, oh, he's got some bad tenants. First servant shows up and they beat him up. And they send him back. So he sends another one and they beat him up. And they send him back. Another one comes and they beat him up. <laughs> And then he, then he says he, he sends a number of them, and they, all of them get beaten up. Some they killed. Now, that's, that should be strange to us as we listen to the parable. And then he says he, he's got a beloved son that he's going to send to them. Now, you don't have to be a genius to figure out who that is, right? Is Jesus telling us? He's got a, he's got a beloved son that he's, he's sending to them. He says they'll respect my husband, and instead they kill him because they, say, they feel like, if we get rid of him, now we're king. Now we're in charge. Sound like authority to you? Now, 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 it's, now it's ours. This, this is days before Jesus actually is arrested and killed. It just tells the story. It's prophetic. How do we understand that parable? It's really interesting. Uh, so the owner in this parable would be whom? Who's the owner? It's God. Okay, he's the owner of all. Um, so when you read the parable, it's easy to go through this, but there's something that we should be amazed about by God. Sends a, um, sends a servant beat up, sends another servant beat up. Sends a, why didn't you just go in and annihilate him from the beginning? It's his stuff. Couldn't he do that? Could I? We should be amazed at the patience of God. And even in our own lives, should we not? How quickly do I turn away from him? How quickly am I faithless? How often in my life has that been? How, how often has that been true in the nation of Israel? We are no different. We should be amazed at the patience of God. He just is. It's a, it's a, it's a small thing in the parable, but it's not insignificant. 
Well, the vineyard, that one's the only one part that might be a little bit difficult. The vineyard, as we talked about last week, in the Old Testament prophets, both figs and vines were often in the, in the prophetic word. Um, their language is often about the nation of Israel. Um, and that's what it is. It, it's the nation of Israel, or we'd even say God's people is what this is. But particularly the nation of Israel is what this is. So that nation is meant to bear fruit. That is bear fruit of godliness. And the sharecroppers would be that priestly cast. The, the Levites, what their job was supposed to do throughout Israel's history, they were responsible for the spiritual care of that vineyard, of those people. What they were supposed to do is to keep directing them towards God. You see, in those days, people didn't have a Bible in their hands like we have. We have them all over the place. It, it was on a scroll. So that was kept in one place. One they were the ones who would preach it. They were the ones who would teach it. They were the ones who would dispense this to the, encourage the people towards God. That was their responsibility. And they had reneged on that very responsibility. They had lost what they were to do. You see this in Israel's history. How a nation turns away. And it's largely that priestly group that was their responsibility. So the prophets come in. And when you read the prophets, you see them speaking against them. How they have not shepherded the people in the way that they should. Uh, you remember maybe Eli's sons and what they did. And just discouraging the people from God. That was their responsibility. You remember Jesus speaking of hirelings. Not, I'm the good shepherd. He talked about hirelings. You remember him saying when he saw the people, he had compassion on them because they were like a sheep without a shepherd. Harassed. This was an indictment against them. The servants who were sent. Who were those servants who were sent to the vineyard and, and to the priests? That would have been the prophets throughout Israel's history. So when you read Isaiah or Jeremiah, Hosea, these are prophets that God sent. They were to speak from God. They were to give a word of correction to the nation, particularly to the priestly group. And if you know Hebrews 11, where it has that whole lineup of these men of faith, how many of them were beaten, were ridiculed, some were, were killed. And then the owner of the vineyard sends his son. This is a parable, actually. It's coming to a pivot point about what God is doing in that very nation at that very time. Now look at verse 9. It's an interesting verse because it's a significant verse. This is pivotal in history. What will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and do what? Give the vineyard to others. What does that mean? What, what's taking place here? You see, the Jewish nation for 1,400 years since the time of Abram until that particular time, they were the exclusive place where people could come and learn about the Lord God. And so that's what the, why the temple was there. What they were meant to be is a people who belonged to God, a people that were for God, a people who were to be worshiping Him, following Him in all their lives. So when people saw them, they saw God. That's why He called them out. If you go to um, Genesis 12, verse 1, He speaks of that call to Abram, I'm making you a blessing so that you will bless the nations. You remember the, the temple that Jesus just cleared. It's that house of prayer for the nations. And they'd not done that. Let me show you in one place. Do you have the Exodus verse? Exodus 19? Okay. So I'm doing my, I'm doing my one year Bible. This was just my, my reading for this week. So I'm in Exodus. Exodus 20 is where the Ten Commandments come in. And this is, this is God as he's, the people have just left um, Egypt and he's speaking of his purposes for the nation. And, and here's what he says. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. He's telling his purposes for that nation. You're the place where people are going to come and know about God. You're the place. They lost that. So in the parable, Jesus says, now this vineyard is going to be given to others. What does that mean? What's he saying? It's getting spread further. It will not be exclusively those who are ethnically Jewish. It's God's people. 
but it's going to be Gentiles too. He's talking about the beginning of the church. And you read the book of Acts and all that, that's, that's what he's saying. This, I'm going to take from the nations now a people. I'm going to make them my people. And they are going to be the place that displays me. It's, it's coming there. That's pretty, pretty powerful, actually. Now, let's look at what he says. Um, Mark 12, verses 10 and 11. Here he's quoting scripture. He's quoting from Psalm 118. He says, The stone that the builders rejected, it has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. I just want to think about this for a moment. This is actually a scripture they would have read that week. They would have sung it that week. Um, but a lot of times uh, people would be um, reciting scripture they didn't understand. And Jesus says, here's what this is saying. Okay? So in that case, the, um, what, what God's doing is building a temple. And so when he says this cornerstone the stone was being rejected, it's becoming the cornerstone. A- any good builders here? Brick, where's Randy's not here, is he? Adam, your dad's not here? should have him give this illustration. He's a bricklayer. There's that when you do a building, the first one down is that cornerstone. It gets laid. Vern, you can verify this maybe for me, okay? But you, you put that one down, and the foundation wall here is anchored by this corner. It's on the corner because this wall is, is lined up there. This wall is lined up there. Then the wall's built up. Everything is anchored on this cornerstone. Is how that is. So it's a metaphor used in the Old Testament. Who is the cornerstone? He's quoting the Psalms, and he's speaking of the very events that are taking place. He's just told him a, a, a parable about the son being killed. Jesus absolutely knows what's going on. He's the stone that they are rejecting. He is the very cornerstone. They don't get all that then. But I got to tell you, they're listening. It's a couple of months later, Peter's preaching. Peter's actually preaching to the very same group that was here trying to convict Jesus and the very same group that actually um, tries Jesus, the Sanhedrin. And Peter quotes this psalm. I don't think I gave you this one. I don't think. This is um, Acts chapter 4, verses 10 to 12. I don't think we have it here, but... Here's what Peter says. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. He has just, he's just healed a lame guy. And they also want to know, hey, whose authority are you doing this in? And here's what Peter says to him, Acts 4. Let it be known to you and all the people of Israel by, by, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I love this next phrase, whom you crucified. He's, Peter's not scared here. He's talking to that same judicial branch, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. By him, this man is standing before you well. And then he says, this Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there's salvation in no one else. For there is no other name among heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Peter's preaching the gospel. He's like, that's the stone. That's the stone. Now, follow me. In, in 1 Peter chapter 2, I think we have this one, but I'm not going to read it. You can go ahead and put it up. Peter's later teaching the church, and here's, he's talking about the temple, okay? And here's the beauty of this. You've got to think of how the built around Christ. Think of the old, the temple in Jerusalem was the geographic place. Here's what he says now. He quotes this same thing about the stone that was rejected is, has become the cornerstone, but now he speaks of the temple differently. The temple's not that building. The temple is the very people of God who are submitted to God's authority. He says, you are living stones that God has built together to be built around that cornerstone. You are. You are the place that people are to see God in. You are the place they are to come to. That's why we say that The church is not a building. The church is God's people gathered together. He's he's put together, built around what? My traditions? The things I like? My styles? Built around the very person of Jesus Christ. His person, his teaching. 
built that way is what Peter's preaching right there. That's beautiful. The other part of this is what? See, back then, the temple was, it was stuck in Jerusalem. Everybody had to go there. If God's people are the temple, what's that mean? Every place we go, God's spirit lives in us. And when people encounter us, what's supposed to happen? They encounter God. They encounter God. If we're built around that temple, built together. So I just, I just say this. Is that what's taken place in our life? When you look at verse 12, what these guys do, their response is they want to seek to arrest Jesus. They want to silence him. Nobody's reading that and going like, well, that's, that, those are smart guys. That's the right thing to do. Now, we read that and we go like, wrong response. They beg off the question. They, they, they don't respond really to this authority of, or who was John the Baptist because they don't want to decide really about the authority of Jesus when they know it plainly. Mark is wanting this whole book down to this. So I'm, we're going to just, we're going to end right here. Who's Jesus? So I'm going to, I'm going to talk about two points of application here. One is this way. Personally, for every single one of us, do not make a non-decision about the person of Jesus Christ and his authority. Again, it might not be a verse, a word that you like, but authority means we recognize clearly that he's God, I'm not, what he says matters, and I'm to come and to submit under that, to live my life under that. Now, you cannot do that unless you're responding to the very call of God and you believe and you, the biblical word is repent. That is, you turn from a life of yourself to him. That's how that happens. And then every day you're begging him for that, for that grace to follow him. And sometimes, I don't know about you if you realize this, but when Jesus calls you to follow him and to do the right thing and to turn to him rather than sin, it's actually hard. Anybody say that? It's actually hard. But it's good and it's right and that is how you will know God. Because he will enable you to do things that you could not do, he will transform your life. That's a whole big discussion, but that is plain and simple how it goes when we yield to his authority. That's personal. The, the second one is this. He's talking here about the transfer that's taking place and how this temple is going to be built around him, around Jesus, the cornerstone. There's a corporate part of this and what, what God's creating. And so, so here we are at Converge Community Church. It, this is still pretty brand new. But here's what God's creating. He's creating a people who belong to him. Not a person. It's not an individual. It's amazing in the scripture how much is collective. Old Testament, New Testament. We are meant to be a people knit together around the very person of Jesus Christ as the anchor, as the cornerstone. Our lives submitted to him are to go that way so that as a collected group of people, we actually display God as imperfect as we are when people encounter us they are meant to encounter him. And that's what we're praying that God does deeply right here. Right here. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. There's a lot of ways you could listen and respond to this. I'm not going to coach you through that, okay? But uh, we've been ending our services since January this way. We're going to do it again. Um, just plan. We're going to give some time of silent prayer. And here's the question I'd like you to ask God. Lord, how do you want me to respond today to this? We never see ourselves accurately. Lord, how do you want me to respond to this? And as he shows you, ask him to help you do that. Okay? Let's, uh, let's pray. I'll close this after about a minute.
Lord, thank you for your patience with us. Thank you that we're here today. Some of us would um, would realize that this has not been a, a long habit in our lives to be in a place like this. Thank you for being a God who speaks, who knows us and knows exactly what we need. God, help us to follow you. I thank you, God, that you know every single person here. You know exactly the kinds of things that are going on in our life right now, the things we struggled with this week. And in every single way, you are the answer. You are the one who wants to lead our lives. You are the only one who has rightful rule and authority. You are. Help us to see that. And God, I pray that you would do that which is impossible in our lives. That you'd give us the faith to believe. We would never believe if you would not work in us. And then, Lord, as you grant faith to believe, then it's to follow you. That is to submit joyfully, willingly to you. I thank you for how you do that, God. It is your miracle. Amen.